Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our church service. My name is Matthew Ackley. I'm our Second Street Campus Worship Director and Pastor Assistant. We are so happy to have you here. I'm Chrissy Sisko. I'm the Children's Ministry Director. Thanks for joining us today. Please take a moment to check out the announcements to see what's happening right now at Cornerstone. Welcome to Cornerstone Church, and thank you for joining us for today's service. Here are some ways for you and your family to stay connected. Women's Bible Study Facilitator Training is on April 30th from 9.30 to 11 a.m. at our March Street campus. Please join us if you are interested in leading a women's Bible study. Registration is on our website and we ask that you complete this by April 28th. Anyone over 16 years old is welcomed and light refreshments will be served. Note that childcare will not be available for this event. Child dedication will be held at all services on Mother's Day weekend, May 7th and 8th. This is an opportunity for parents to commit to raising their children according to God's Word. Please register on our website. Restoring Hope Ministries is holding a bike tour planning meeting on May 7th. This year's tour dates are July 31st through August 5th. The Bike Tour is our annual fundraiser for Restoring Hope Ministries, impacting the lives of our brothers and sisters in the DRC. To learn more, come to Second Street Campus at 8 a.m. on May 7th and sign up on our website to be the cyclists, support team members, and planning crew. Here are some of the ministries that are offered at Cornerstone Church. We have two campuses, one on March Street in College Hill and one on South 2nd Street in downtown Easton. Children's ministry is offered during our 9 a.m. service at March Street and our 10 a.m. service at 2nd Street on Sunday. And nursery is provided for the 9 a.m. service at March Street and both the Saturday night and Sunday morning services at 2nd Street. The youth group has a worship service, games, and fellowship on Sundays from 6 to 8 p.m. at 2nd Street Campus. Our men's ministry meets the first Saturday of every month, as well as hosting a yearly retreat. The women's ministry offers Bible studies and other events, such as the recent wellness workshop and the upcoming women's retreat. Riverside Ministry serves the community on Monday nights with meals, clothing donations, and spiritual food of the gospel each week. The backbone of our ministries are community and discipleship groups where small group fellowships and Bible studies are done to grow together in faith. For more information, please visit our website at cornerstonechurches.org. And here's a quick look into what our worship is like here at Cornerstone, followed by this week's sermon. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Almighty fortunes, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. Yes, you 
All right. Well, we hope you enjoyed that clip from our worship services. And for those of you that are able, and for those of you who are maybe just checking us out, we would invite you to come down to one of our services so we can worship together in person. And now we're ready to dive back into our Acts series. And we're going to be talking a little bit today about the Holy Spirit and how he leads mm. us. We're going to be heading back into our Acts series. It's been some time since we've been in this series, but I'm really excited for us to be able to dive in to this series together uh, this evening. We've been in a series, uh, or we were previously in this series, titled To the Ends of the Earth. How many of you remember our Acts series? Yeah, how do you forget it, right? How do you forget it, right? So we've been in that series for a long time. This is actually, this evening will be part 42. How cool is that? Part 42 of that series. And I'm excited as we continue working through the book of Acts together. So the last time that we were in the book of Acts was all the way back in November, if I remember correctly. Uh, correctly. So I want to refresh uh, your memories. I know I had to get a refresher myself as I prepared for this weekend, but I want to refresh our memories so we can get back into the book of Acts. And I really think that this is like an epic adventure. It really is. This is like Lord of the Rings level epic adventure. And I want you to think of it that way because oftentimes we approach the Bible uh, in a really, I don't know, and not in that kind of sense, right? We don't think of it being like this epic adventure, but the book of Acts is really this epic adventure. And so we're going to hop back into this together this evening. And I hope that you can see it that way, that you can see how incredible this adventure is and how you and I actually get invited to be a part of it and how God has an amazing adventure for our lives as well, especially for those of us who have a desire to be obedient to his mission and for us to live on mission. Because God has called us to live on mission and he's given us a mission. So if you remember the book of Acts, I'm going to give you a quick quick uh, reminder. Uh, the book of Acts uh, starts with the resurrected Christ ascending into heaven. We talked about that already this evening. Matt and Worship talked about how last week was Easter. We celebrated uh, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. But we know that he remained after his resurrection and he was seen by up to 500 people before he ascended back into heaven after his resurrection. So the book of Acts starts with the resurrected Christ ascending into heaven. But before he goes before he ascends back to the right hand of the Father, he promises, if you remember, the Holy Spirit to his disciples, you and I as well, consequently. So he promises the Holy Spirit to his disciples for the purpose of being his witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Hence, the name for our series, To the Ends of the Earth. Then... We see the Holy Spirit fill the disciples just as Jesus promised. We see the Holy Spirit fill the disciples on the day of Pentecost. This is found in Acts chapter 2. And immediately Peter, the man who denied Christ, now boldly preaches the good news about Jesus Christ right in the middle of Jerusalem. And it's at this point that the church is born and from there, the numbers of those who believe are added to the church daily. It just begins to grow rapidly. And as the church grows at an unbelievable pace, it experiences, as you would expect, growing pains, right? And we read about that all throughout the beginning of the book of Acts. Actually, throughout the entire book of Acts, there's all of these obstacles and growing pains that the church faces and is constantly needing to overcome. But as the church is born, it experiences growing pains until Stephen, one of its leaders, becomes the first martyr of the church. This marks a massive shift in the church and it is scattered from Jerusalem. And as a result, the church expands beyond 
Jerusalem and into the surrounding regions. And one place that the church makes its way to is Antioch, right? And so now it's like we see, uh, it's like a new part of the story, a new chapter, uh, a new page has turned in the story. And, and, and we're in Antioch, and it's around this time that the word begins to get out, and even Gentiles, non-Jews, start receiving salvation, which was a fulfillment of God's promise to Abraham that one day the nations would be blessed through Abraham's offspring, right? And so we see that fulfillment of the promise. But during this persecution of the church, after Stephen is martyred, during that time, Jesus gets a hold of the man responsible for much of the church's troubles. And he sets that man apart as God's chosen vessel to the Gentiles. This man is none other than Paul, formerly known as Saul. And so now we have another incredible uh, pivot in this epic adventure. Well, Barnabas, who was another prominent church leader, brings Paul with him to the church in Antioch. And it's from Antioch that we see the first missionary journey, right? They head out from Antioch. The church sends Barnabas and Paul out on their first missionary journey. And they begin planting churches everywhere they go even and especially among the Gentiles. And there are so many incredible details to this story that I'm kind of missing out on here. So I'd encourage you, if you have some time this week, go back and reread it and get a refresher because you don't want to miss all that God is doing in this incredible book. And so some time passes after the first missionary journey Right? And Paul and Barnabas are ready to go back out and strengthen the churches that they planted. Additionally, they want to share some good news about aspects of the law that the Gentiles aren't obligated to keep, which was a huge relief for the early church. Unfortunately, though, before the trip starts, Paul and Barnabas have a falling out over a young man named Mark who happens to be Barnabas' cousin. So on their first missionary journey, Mark deserted Paul and Barnabas. And now upon the second missionary journey, Paul demands unwavering commitment. Who can blame him? Yet Barnabas wants to give Mark a second chance. Who can blame him? And they split over this disagreement. And we both, we tend to fall on either side of of the argument, don't we? We kind of feel bad for Mark, but then we understand Paul's dilemma. And then we feel bad for Barnabas because Barnabas is trying to invest in the next generation. Well, their disagreement causes them to go separate ways. And Paul brings a man named Silas with him instead. But along the way, As we read just before we get into our passage this evening, Paul picks up his own young protege, doesn't he? He picks up Timothy at one of the churches that Paul and Barnabas planted together. And he joins Paul and Silas on their second missionary journey, which brings us up to speed with where we are today in our reading. So let's read together from Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 10. Do me a favor, would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? This is known as the Macedonian call. And here's what it says in verse 6. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there urging him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God called us to preach the gospel to them. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. You may be seated. 
So this section of Acts is referred to as we already saw, and it probably says in your Bible, it's referred to as the Macedonian call. And although it's only four short verses, it marks another important shift in the book of Acts and the expansion of the gospel. As we read through this story, I can't help but wonder what must have been going on in Paul's mind. What must Paul have been thinking and feeling as he heads out now on his own? No longer with his partner in crime, Barnabas, by his side. Barnabas was his mentor. And now Paul finds himself at a place where he's on his own. Barnabas and Paul parted ways over, as we already discussed, parted ways over a young man named Mark. And and now Paul decides to bring a different young man onto the team, Timothy. As they go about their mission to strengthen the churches, God keeps closing doors in their face. And midway through the trip, they somehow find themselves at a dead end in the middle of a city called Troas. Troas was actually four miles south of the city of Troy. So it kind of gives you a little bit of historical perspective as to where they found themselves. And they found themselves in the city of Troas with the sea in front of them and nowhere to go. Did Paul make a mistake? Did he mess up? I mean, if he had Barnabas with him, surely this wouldn't have happened. If they just wouldn't have fought over Mark, if he just would have, you know, let Barnabas have his way, maybe Paul wouldn't find himself at a place where he's at a dead end. Well, obviously, no, Paul didn't make a mistake, but you and I have the luxury of knowing that, don't we? Because we read how the story goes. We we hear how the story goes. We know what happens next. But Paul and Silas didn't have any idea what was going to happen, just like you and I in our own lives, right? We find ourselves at these moments where we have no idea where to go from here. And that's where Paul and Barnabas found themselves, knowing not where to go. You know, two specific occasions come to mind as, uh, for me as I read this story and reflect on my own life. At different moments in my own life when I was looking for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I'm sure that you found yourself at those places as well where you were at a crossroads or you were at this moment where you had to go left or you had to go right. You had to make an important decision and you were looking for God to tell you what to do. First, I remember being on a missions trip in Morocco. This was a really cool time in my life. I was a senior in college and we went to Morocco and we were traveling through the Sahara Desert. How cool is that? We were sharing the gospel with the Saharawi is what they were called. They were actually, they lived in Western Morocco, but they didn't consider themselves to be a part of Morocco because there was a civil war in Morocco and they didn't consider themselves to be a part of that country. At one point in the trip, we actually drove through a live minefield. It was like the coolest thing in the world, right? They knew the path, it was carved through. At one point we stopped and I actually picked up a 50 caliber bullet right off of the ground. It was just people were out practicing, the army was out practicing and you could just pick them up right off the ground. But just five, 10 feet off of the road, if you would have stepped out into the desert, there could have been mines right there. And we, we trekked through the desert with our convoy, and we would communicate with one another using walkie-talkies. I'm telling you, the whole thing was like National Geographic, Discovery Channel. It was one of those like really cool memories that I have. And oftentimes as we trek through the desert, we would come to a fork in the road. And this is where the missionary stopped, and we would pray together, and we would listen for the Holy Spirit to tell us right or left. And this pattern began to develop, and we started to take every right turn we could. And for some reason, one of the individuals in our group decided, well, that's what we're going to do. Every time we come to a fork in the road, we're going to take the right turn. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that you can only take so many right turns before you end up back where you started, right? However, we didn't get to that point yet. We actually took a right turn, and we ended up at a dead end. 
What happened? Did we miss it? Did we somehow not hear correctly? And it was from this point on that the missionary took us on a path that he had already laid out and was familiar with. At another crossroads moment in my life, I found myself at this point where I needed to make an important decision. It was the most important decision that I had made in my life up until that point. This was definitely a heavier and more intense moment than just the mission trip story where we were just kind of playing around in the desert. This was an important moment, and, and because it was so important, I loved to go for hikes, and I decided that I would get up before the sun rose, and I would go for a hike and pray with the expectation that I would hear from God. And I remember hiking through the woods. You have to get this picture in your mind. Hiking through the woods, and I was praying out loud like I was a crazy person, asking that God would direct me where to go. Because I knew that the decision that I made would affect more than just me. It would affect my friends and my family. And I remember as I got to the end of the hike, I was thinking, this is it. This is the moment. And I heard nothing. There was actually one moment where I thought that like I had heard something in my head. You know what I mean? Like those sort of moments where I thought that that was God speaking, but I realized I was just so desperate to hear God's voice that it was just something that I was doing on my own, that it wasn't really God who was speaking. I was so desperate to hear God, and it was in that moment that I called out to him, and I was facing a tough decision, and I didn't hear his voice. You know, at first glance, it doesn't seem like my stories and this story that we're reading about has anything in common, right? I heard nothing from God, whereas Paul and Silas were very clearly directed by the Holy Spirit, but I don't think it's quite as simple as it seems. When reading this passage, I think at least, whenever we read this passage or whenever we read the book of Acts, when we read this passage, we need to be careful of building an entire theology out of how God speaks to us. Whenever we read stories and acts like this one we read here in Acts 16, we immediately think that this is how it's supposed to be all of the time. Like God is supposed to tell us when to turn left, when to turn right, which college to go to, who to marry, and how many kids we should have. And the list ultimately, we become paralyzed by fear and indecision, just waiting around, twiddling our thumbs, waiting for God to tell us what to do. Has anybody else found themselves in a situation like that? I know that I have. That is not where we find Paul in the story, though. where we can feel something, right? That's the moments that we focus on and say, well, that must have been the Holy Spirit speaking to me. But if we look at the book of Acts and all throughout the book of Acts, we can see that God is constantly leading his church. Paul didn't expect for him and Barnabas to separate, but that was the Holy Spirit working. We might not look at it that way initially, but after Paul and Barnabas separated, it caused there to be two dynamic ministry teams being used by God. And Paul was then able to bring Silas onto the team, and ultimately he was able to disciple Timothy. So you see, it wasn't just when the Holy Spirit closed a door obviously in front of them. It wasn't just when Paul received the vision. It was also in that moment when Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement. And it's all throughout the book of Acts, but we seem to only focus on those few moments. Not just the 
or door where God gives us a vision. The Holy Spirit constantly directs our steps even when we are unaware. Do you believe that? Yes, there are those occasions where he does choose to speak very clearly into our situation. But we have to stop having such a small view of the Holy Spirit as if he's limited to specific moments. We need to realize that we have been, as is promised, we have been filled with the Spirit of God, right? Which means that every step we take as a believer is ordered by God. Now that's a large view of God. That's a huge view of God to consider that as you make decisions in life and go about living your life, somehow God weaves the decisions that you make into his sovereign plan for you. That's a huge view of who God is. Proverbs 16.9 says that the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. This is what we see the triune God doing in this story. Did you catch that? It starts off by saying that the Holy Spirit forbade them from going into Asia. And then it says the Spirit of Jesus. And then at the end it says that they were led by God. That the entire triune God is active and at work in not just Paul's life, but also in our lives, ensuring that we get to exactly where he wants us to go. Now, I say all of this because Luke is not giving us a formula for how to hear the Holy Spirit speak. He's not giving us a formula for the guidance of the Holy Spirit, nor does Luke intend for us to read this story and expect that we need to hear from the Holy Spirit before we obey. In fact, if you read the story, Luke doesn't even give us the details about how the Holy Spirit directed them, does he? He just says that it happened, which I think is intentional. Because if the details were there, we would expect God to do the same thing in our life whenever we came to a crossroads. But Luke just says the Holy Spirit directed them. And so we need to realize that this isn't a formula. Even when Paul receives a vision, it's apparent from the wording that they still discuss and then ultimately conclude that it was, in fact, God leading them to Macedonia. However, they still needed to act in faith and obedience. Just as a consideration, why would God speak to us and tell us what to do when we struggle being obedient with what he already told us what to do? Do you know what I'm saying? Like he's given us his word. Do you really believe that if God just told you what to do, you would do it? Because he already has. In his word he's told us and we don't believe in faith enough to do what he's already told us to do. Something tells him that if the Holy Spirit told us what to do all of the time, we would still question, was that really you? And we would still struggle with obedience. So then what do we learn from this passage regarding God's guidance for our lives? Because God is active in our lives and God does guide us. And so there are several travel tips I would give you as we navigate God's plan for our lives. And the first travel tip is chart your path. Chart your path. Have a plan and move forward in faith. Make a decision and trust that God is working in your life. Paul didn't wait around for God to tell him what to do. You can actually go back into verse 36 of chapter 13, where Paul said to Barnabas, let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaimed the word of the Lord and see how they are. We seem to miss it there, don't we? We seem to miss that God was working in Paul's decision making. We focus on when the Holy Spirit closes or opens doors or gives Paul a vision, but we forget that Paul actually made a decision here and stepped out in faith and trusted God. We could easily miss that detail. 
But Paul wasn't uncertain as to what to do. He had a large view of God's sovereignty that ultimately freed him to move about his life with the confidence that God was orchestrating every single one of his steps. Do you have for this idea because we can gain insight as to faith and because he was obedient to God's word that we can actually learn from Paul's example and there's two that stick out to me. I don't know. There's plenty that we can, we can read all of the New Testament. I mean, Paul went on to write two thirds of the New Testament, but there were two that stuck out to me in preparation for this sermon that I want to share with you that I think might be helpful for you. And one of those uh, examples is actually in the letter that Paul wrote to the Philippian church, which happened to be a church in Macedonia, which is just, is really cool to consider. But in Philippians 14, this is one of the tips or tricks that you can use in your own life as you chart your course. Paul says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Forget what lies behind. Let go of the past. We have to do that together. I know that there are some of you, myself included, that we can't seem to let go of the things in our past and they seem to affect our right here, right now, and they seem to paralyze us moving into the future. But Paul is saying in scripture, stop, let go of the past. Move forward in faith as you pursue the prize, which is Christ Jesus. That's one of Paul's mindsets that he uses as he moves forward in faith. Another one is found in 1 Corinthians 4.3. And I can't believe this is in the scriptures. This blows my mind. I can't believe Paul said this. This is what he says. He says in 1 Corinthians 4.3, But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. Can you believe Paul said that? He's Paul saying, I don't care what you think of me. I don't care if you think that I'm doing the wrong thing or that I'm not doing, I'm trusting the Lord's leading. As a matter of fact, I don't even judge me. I'm just faithful to God's word and I do what I know he told me to do. I don't care care if you judge me. I don't even judge me. Could you imagine if you stopped judging yourself so harshly and you started to view yourself as God's child and you believe that you were filled with the Spirit? Could you imagine what you could do with your life if you just trusted that God was sovereignly orchestrating your footsteps and you stopped judging yourself so harshly or stopped caring what other people thought? These two ideas can help us begin to move forward with confidence as we chart our course. Secondly, we should expect the unexpected. We all know that, right? We should expect the unexpected. We need to details, but things clearly are not going as planned, are they? However, that doesn't stop Paul. Notice the Spirit leads with both negative and positive examples, doesn't he? However, it's all God, so don't take setbacks in life so personally. 
go, stop focusing on the past, and move forward. Once again, for Paul and his companions, God is about to do something that they never saw coming. So after experiencing what seemed like failure, they find themselves in Troas, facing the sea. And this is where Paul receives a vision of a Macedonian man saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Later, Paul would actually return to those other areas that God caused him to pass by, and he would successfully plant churches in those locations, which I hope that's an encouragement to you as well, because I hope you realize that God might be asking you to not head in a certain direction in your life, and it's not take it from you. It's because it's not the time. It's not right right now, right? Because God brought Paul back around on his missionary journey so that he could bring the gospel. But Paul and his companions to take the gospel across the sea where they never thought possible into the land of Macedonia. So Paul and his company conclude together, meaning that they tested the vision and discerned that it was in fact from God. And they embark on an entirely different adventure into uncharted territory. That is what the gospel does. It constantly expands into areas where it never reached before, which leads me to my last tip. Remember, you're not the guide. God will bring you to where you need to be. We've got, I, I, this, if, I, if you don't hear me say anything else tonight, I hope you hear this. I really do because I'm still trying to take a hold of this truth, Okay. So I'm preaching this to myself just as much as I'm preaching this to you. I've struggled and struggle with this as well. But we've got to get away from using language surrounding the will of God that's not helpful. What I mean is that we have to stop saying things to ourselves like, I missed God's will. Or that I am not sure I might be outside of God's will. Do you know what I mean? Because that's like a serious fear that if you've missed God's will for your life or if you're outside of God's will for your life, like how do I get back to where I need to be? I want you to know that unless you are living in unrepentant sin or are just outright disobeying God, which again is sin, unless that's happening in your life, you are in God's will for your life. And so we have to stop using that sort of language that causes us to fear that somehow we're outside of God's will. Don't you think that Paul had reason to doubt he was in God's will when he had so many setbacks and failures? Don't you think it might have seemed to Barnabas or to Paul and the rest of his companions? Do you think that it might have seemed like this trip was doomed from the start? when Barnabas and Paul argued and split, this trip got started off on a pretty rough foot, didn't it? Don't you think that there might have been a point where they finally got to Troas and they're looking at the ocean ahead of them and they're thinking, you know what, we might have missed it. Let's go back to Antioch, we'll regroup, we'll figure it out, and we'll head out from there. No, God had a completely different plan. And that's when he receives this incredible vision. God is our guide and he knows the plan. We need to remember to hold our plans loosely and trust in God in difficult moments. You know, from my earlier story that I shared, I remember when I finally had the courage to make the decision, that I finally made the decision, I was terrified But someone close to me said to me in a moment of doubt that I made the decision in faith and with that same faith, I needed to keep walking out the decision that I made. You made the decision in faith. Keep in that same faith walking out the life that God has called to you, called you to. Paul trusted God and had faith that he was the one who called him. Paul might have had a plan, but he knew that he wasn't the guide. Nevertheless, Paul's faith and trust in God enabled him to persevere, to endure setbacks, and to keep moving forward. 
So we've spent a lot of time this evening, and I'm wrapping up in just a moment. We spent a lot of time, is this making sense? Are we tracking together? Okay. We spent a lot of time focused on the guidance of the Holy Spirit in tonight's uh, passage. But if we're not careful, we can miss what is perhaps the entire point of this pivotal passage. As we read this story, we can see that the gospel expands and spreads further than they ever thought possible. God continues throughout the book of Acts all the way up until our day and into the future. God continues to oversee the transmission of the gospel. God is with his people when they live on mission and he will move heaven and earth as they work together to make disciples of all people to the ends of the earth. God cares about you and he cares about your circumstances. God is concerned for you this evening for what concerns you. Certainly we know that, right? But I'm telling you, if we can get past ourselves and the See if God doesn't do the unimaginable in your life. If you want to be confident to live a life full of meaning, embark on this God has called you in your home, in your workplace, in your school, in your relationships. Begin this evening to chart your path. Expect the unexpected. And remember, you're not the guide. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, God, I thank you for your word. God, it's so good. God, you are so good. It's like you know what you're doing. And it's like you've had a plan from the beginning of time. And it's because you did and you do. And God, you have a plan for our lives. Your word tells us that you do. Your word says that we are your workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good work that you prepared in advance for us, God. So Lord, I pray this evening, Lord, I know that we are all facing circumstances in our lives. Maybe we're at a crossroads. Maybe we're at a moment where we need to make a decision. God, help us to make a decision in faith. Lord, knowing that we're going to experience and expecting setbacks, but ultimately knowing that we're not responsible because you are our guide. And as we live obediently to you and your word, we can be confident, God, that you will get us where we need to go. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Kyle, for sharing that sermon with us. You know, the Holy Spirit is still alive and active and working in our lives today. And we would love to hear from you. If you have a story of how the Holy Spirit has led you, please take a moment to share it in the comments below. Amen. Well, thanks for tuning in for our services, and we hope you have a blessed week.